But you know, over these past few months, really it's been that long, uh, we have really explored how amazing kingdom life is. You know, it is a life that has been freely bestowed upon us by the work of the king. And it is a life that is lived by the loving supply of the Heavenly Father. But today I ask you, as we continue to make our way through to the end of this sermon of all sermons by the King, today we are challenged with and we ask you to hear the principle of warning. The principle of warning given by the King. You know, there are, because there are those around us, see them every day, on TV, on YouTube, on podcasts, through blog posts, books, all those types of things. There are those around us who would want to lure us away, or out of step, excuse me, out of step with the work of God's grace in our life. And we talked about last time about that narrow gate and that difficult way and the direction and how we should be committed to walking this way of grace and walking and continuing on in the grace and work that Jesus has done in our lives and that the King is supply and that God is supplying in our lives. And, and we're working, walking that way. And, and, and it's, it's, but we are always challenged with the allurement of that broad way, that road that is most traveled, but that destructive road that is most traveled. And so as we continue to press on and make our way down this difficult way, that road less traveled, that victorious road less traveled, we must heed the warning of the king because there are those along that broad way that are saying, why on earth are you there? Life shouldn't be that hard. It shouldn't be that difficult. And they are luring us out of step with the work of God's grace in our life. So hear the principle of warning today. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets. You know, that term translated false prophets is a compound word. And it begins with that prefix, pseudo. Now, most of us are probably familiar that we've heard words with pseudo before it. Have you heard of the word pseudonym? Pseudonym. A pseudonym is a fake name chosen to conceal one's true identity. It's a false name. You know, through the centuries, authors have written under pen names or pseudonyms for various reasons. Some because they just want to conceal their identity. They have issues with the fame. They're trying to keep who they are secret. Some just to be funny. Others, because they've already had other works that they've done and completed, and so they're writing under this one to not detract from their already acclaimed fame. So they do it for various reasons. You know, have any of you heard of Theodore Geisel? You know, he was that student of Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, in the U.S., and he would write and draw cartoons for a local humor magazine. Well, one day, he and a couple of his mates got a bit of of trouble during the Prohibition era, for alcohol offenses. And so he lost his contract with the magazine. could no longer write for them. But to continue to get that income, he started submitting his work under his middle name. And with that, Dr. Seuss, the beloved children's author and tongue twister master, was born. How about Samuel Langhorne Clements? He was a worker on the Mississippi River on a steamboat. Now, for a steamboat to safely travel the river, they had to, they, they, the water had to be at least three and a half meters deep. And so to measure that depth, they had a line. And they would measure the water line, and when it hit that second mark on that line, they would yell out, Mark Twain! So when Clemens began to write his short humorous stories, Mark Twain was engraved in history. Now, how about this one? Do any of you, have any of you heard of Stanley Martin Liber? You know, he had a desire to be a serious writer. But he got his start writing comic books. And so Liber chose a pseudonym for his kid's stuff so that he could have his official name for his more serious works of publication. 
But soon, Stanley became one of the most recognized, influential comic book writers ever. They've made movies about his book works. They've on, they've, it's, it's been going on for years. And that pseudonym, that pen name he chose, has now been engraved in history as Stan Lee the creator of the Marvel's comics. Eventually, he adopted that name legally, so he's no longer Stanley Martin Labor, but he was officially Stan Lee. So you have these authors that have chosen pseudonyms to conceal their identities of who they are. But you know, as we come back to this time, in the group that our Lord was addressing, the king was addressing, they were not un unfamiliar with false prophets. I mean, false prophets had plagued Israel for centuries. And very well were the one, could have been the ones who are one of the main reasons why they were now practically countryless. You know, for their own per, per prestige and power, these people, these false prophets, pose as the messengers of God, conning an entire nation into thinking that they were spiritually okay. Jeremiah 14, verse 14. And the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, divinations, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. God commanded Ezekiel to preach against them. Ezekiel 13, verses 2 to 3. Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy, and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. So they were not unfamiliar with false prophets and the trouble that they caused. But now the king wars that these individuals will continue to pose a tremendous danger to kingdom life and that the kingdom citizens must be ever watchful and discerning as they continue down that path of grace. Matthew chapter 7, verses 20 and 21, we're skipped down to these few verses. Therefore, by their fruits, he says, you will know them. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. There's the keys to being watchful and discerning for these ones who want to lure you out of step with the work of God's grace in your life. So hear the message of warning today by the king. Beware of false prophets. Why? Because it's their nature to deceive. It is their nature to deceive. Look at the second part of verse 15. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You know, that term sheep, when used to describe God's people, is a precious one. It points to our complete dependence upon Him for all facets of our life and well-being. Psalm 95, verse 7, For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Psalm 100, verse 3, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. You know, by acknowledging ourselves as God's sheep, we are declaring our need for God's sufficiency and care. We need Him in our life. Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It is a precious thing to be called a sheep of the King. means we are in His care. He's, we're looking to Him for provision for our lives. And as you think about it, in kingdom life, there is no hierarchy. All live under the loving and sovereign rule of the King and the gracious direction of the Good Shepherd. What does Jesus say? John 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice and know them, and, and I know them, and they follow me. There's not necessarily a hierarchy among the good pastures of the Good Shepherd, those green pastures. 
You know, no matter our age, our years as a citizen, our social status, our degrees and certifications, we are all just sheep in the pasture of the good shepherd. And it is a precious thing. But within the green pastures of the good shepherd, we all have a role to play. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14, For the body is not one member, but many. So we are all equal. We all just looking to the shepherd for our direction, for care, for his, his protection and other things. But we all have a role within the green pastures of the shepherd to play. Because a body is not one, but many. And though we are all responsible to the good shepherd for how we fulfill our roles among the sheep, as one of the sheep, I'm a sheep, you're a sheep, bah. But as we all are responsible to the Good Shepherd for how we fulfill our role within these green pastures, you will find that there are some who have been entrusted with a greater responsibility. Not necessarily that there's some bigwig or important person, but they have been entrusted by the shepherd with a bit more responsibility for certain things. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. The elders who are among you, so not above you, but are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So the good shepherd, our king, has gifted and entrusted certain sheep with the task of helping him feed and care for the flock so that the sheep would mature and grow properly. Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So all equal... We all have different responsibilities to fulfill within the green pastures of the Good Shepherd. But there are some where he has entrusted greater responsibility. They actually have to give a greater account to the Good Shepherd. Because he has entrusted his sheep to their care. Now, false prophets are masters of disguise. Because they weasel themselves into these positions of trust by deceiving the sheep with sweet words and good works, portraying themselves to be genuine sheep who care and have some insight into the life of the sheep. And so they weasel themselves in. They earn the trust and by, by sweet-talking them in various things and, this, and deceptions. They're masters of disguise. Mark 13, verse 22. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 14. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. But really, the only thing genuine about these people is their craving for power and recognition. False prophets are deceptive little wolves who feed off the unsuspecting generosity of the sheep. They disguise themselves. Yeah, I'm a sheep. Yeah, here, this is, look at all this stuff that I can do, and this is how I can do all this type of stuff. They do all that. And they deceive them, and they prey upon the unsuspecting generosity of the sheep. 
Romans 16 and verse 18. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. 2 Timothy 3, verses 6 to 7. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There's been various con men throughout history. One of them was created, a movie was made about one of them called Catch Me If You Can. His name was Frank Abagnale. He made his living, he made a life out of the deception, deceiving others. You know, even as a child, Frank started out by using his father's credit card to buy auto parts, and then he would sell them back to the, the, the servo station at a reduced price. So his father was flipping the bill for everything he was buying, and then he was making a beautiful profit with no financial overhead. This deception would continue. He spent two years as an adult getting free flights all around the world, posing as a Pan Am Airlines pilot, preying upon the generosity of competing airlines for offering pilots free flights. It's also said that he posed as a medical supervisor for 11 months, unquestioned. There are accounts of him making a mockery of the legal and educational system because he he posed as an accredited lawyer and a certified teacher. He made his living off the unsuspecting gullibility and generosity of others. It was his nature, was Frank Abagnale's nature to deceive. So will you hear the warning of the king? False prophets are lethal to kingdom life. They are the masters of disguise, for it is their nature to deceive. They come looking like sheep, but they are actually raving wolves who care nothing for the sheep. So as you make your way down that path of grace, walking that, to the that narrow gate and along that difficult way, be warned there are those who would lure you off this path of grace and away from God's work of grace in your life. Oh, they look good, but be warned. But also be warned, for not only is it their nature to deceive but soon you come to find out that their fruit is evil. Their fruit is evil. Look at verse 16. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. And in the context of Scripture, you'll find many references to both real fruit and symbolic fruit. You know, there are references to the actual fruit grown from various plants. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 5, I made myself gardens and orchards, and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. There's symbolic references to made in describing children as fruit. Psalm 127, verse 3, Behold, children are an heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. But then there's words and songs of our mouth that are described as fruit. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Therefore by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But there is even more profound symbolism to fruit. It's the fruit of someone's life. And this fruit could be good or it could be bad, depending on the condition and attitude of one's heart. Matthew 12, verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Matthew 12, verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, but an evil man out out of the evil treasures brings forth evil things. So the fruit of our lives could be good or bad, depending on the condition and attitude of the heart. So a kingdom citizen is connected to the living water. John 4, verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So we've asked of him and he's given to us living water. As a kingdom citizen, 
I am connected to the spring that never runs dry. But kingdom citizens are also attached to the true vine. John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Therefore, the fruit produced from the life of a kingdom citizen should be fruit that is fit for the king's lips. Colossians 1, verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Our fruit should be good as citizens of the kingdom. We're connected to living water. We have, we're connected to the vine. We have everything we need, as Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, that to, to, to live godly. He's provided unto us great and precious promises that by these we might live as we ought to live. But false prophets are not sourcing their life from the spring of living water. False prophets are rejecting the life that flows from the vine. And so the result leads to fruit of their life and ministry being putrid to the nose and sour to the lips of the king. The fruit is bad. The fruit is evil. Matthew 12, verse 34, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speaking good things, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus says, your heart is evil. You are a bad tree. So how can your fruit be good? You know, false prophets put a whole new meaning on the term bad apple. For they are the producers of bad apples. Their roots draw from a wisdom that is earthly, a wisdom that is sensual, a a wisdom that is demonic. Therefore, the fruit of their lives and those who follow them are going to be corrupted. James chapter 3, verses 14 and 16. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So the king sounds the warning today. Enter at the narrow gate. Pursue the difficult way. Be warned. Beware of false prophets, for they are, it's their nature to deceive. They look good. They look okay. But be warned. They are lethal to kingdom life. They're masters of disguise. And the fruit is evil. And unless something changes, unless something happens within their hearts and they change, they have a sad end. They have a sad end. False teachers and those who are led astray by them do not have a happy ending. You know, what happens to a tree? We have our leader, Mr. Clip, here. What happens to a tree when it produces bad fruit or it produces no fruit? It becomes firewood or mulch. Matthew chapter 7, verse 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It is sad to see something that should have brought much joy and sustenance to life be reduced to chunks or chips of wood that are cast into a fire or cast or scattered across the garden. Yet this is the sad end to false prophets. All the fame and success success that they have had in this earthly life will be reduced to rubble. And those who are taken captive by them are lured into a false security. Look at verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. But you know what makes this end 
of false prophets even sadder than the fact that the multitudes that they deceived is that they become so good at their own deception that they end up deceiving themselves into thinking that they are one of the sheep. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13, But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You know, how sad is this? Not only do they lure unsuspecting individuals to false security, but they lure them, they lull themselves into thinking that they are secure. What a rude awakening that will be for these poor souls when they stand before the king and are numbered not with the sheep to whom they thought they belonged, but with the goats. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 32. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Hear the king's warning. Beware of false prophets, for they have a sad end. You know, to kingdom citizens, ignorance is not bliss. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3, a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. But the simple pass on in our punished. We must learn to test the spirits and discern of what sort they are. 1 John 4 verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone in out into the world. But then you say, how do I do this? How is this done? Well, the key to such discernment is found in becoming consumed with what is genuine and real. We must know for ourselves what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom and what it means to live a kingdom life. We must become so familiar with that. That when a counterfeit comes across, we'll know. John 8, verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Be diligent, or some say study, to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, any person who is tasked with identifying counterfeit currency spends hours becoming familiar with the real deal. They become so familiar with that real thing that they can quickly notice something is off when they come across a counterfeit. And now for the past four months and over 15 paragraphs of Scripture, we have delved into what it means to be a genuine citizen of what it means to live in the kingdom. The king has laid it out for us. And as we make our way through Matthew, we'll learn more and more what kingdom life is like. The king has revealed to us what the pure fruit of a kingdom life is and what the true will of God for the kingdom citizen is. He has told us those things. And so as you make your way towards that narrow gate, be on the watch for those who would woo you out of step of the work of God's grace in your life. If someone is teaching and or whose life does not seem to sync up with the principles of the kingdom that we have talked about for these past four months, step away. Keep on going down that path of grace. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we've just been going through for the past four months, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, 
but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reveling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is is a means of gain. From such, withdraw thyself. Now, I know there will be times where perhaps we need to address these issues. And earlier in the chapter of Matthew chapter 7, we talked about that. Judge not lest you also be judged. And how you go about addressing those things. So if God would direct you to address it, address it. But the focus is stay the course. Continue in the grace of God. Heed the warning of the king. Beware of false prophets. As you make your way down, headed towards that narrow gate, down that difficult path, beware. And continue in the grace of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. Watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for thy word. Thank you for the warding by the king. Lord, it's been wonderful to go through and see what kingdom life is like. To see all that you've bestowed upon us as kingdom citizens and what you have for us as kingdom citizens. But Lord, there are many out there who wish to lure us out of step from your work of grace in our life by laying upon us heavy burdens, by subverting what it means to be holy and godly in Christ Jesus. Let us get so familiar with true, genuine kingdom life that when the counterfeits come across our path, we'll know. Oh, they may look like sheep, but they are wolves. And the fruit that they produce is evil because they are a bad tree. And Lord, their end is very, very sad. Well, let us heed your warning today. Let us beware of false prophets as we make our way to that narrow gate down that difficult path. Father, we love you. We praise you. We look forward to seeing what you're going to do in Christ's name. Amen.